Good morning, good evening, wherever you are across the world and the universe. Welcome to my Quantum Living Podcast, where we talk about anything and everything at the intersection of science and spirituality. I'm your host, Anna Anderson, quantum coach, Reiki master, and theta meditation teacher. Above all, an inquisitive soul. Since my early childhood, I've been on a quest to find out how life really works. And the best clue I've got so far is the sacred alchemy of physics and metaphysics, science and spirituality, mind, body and spirit, which together reveal the truths we all want to know. Who am I? Why am I here? What life is all about? How can I live my life to realize my highest potential with fulfillment, prosperity and joy? How can I manifest what I want? I'd love to share with you on this podcast what I have learned over the years and bring you inspiring conversations with my guests who will share their expertise as well. Welcome to the brand new, exciting season four of Quantum Living. Okay, let's begin. Hello and welcome back to Quantum Living. As you can tell, I continue my exploration of consciousness, the quantum field, bioenergy that carries information, and quantum healing, which are all my favorite topics. If you haven't yet listened to my interview with Dr. Eben Alexander, Is Consciousness All That Is?, and with Julie Ryan, Healing Through the Quantum Field, or to my most recent solo episode, The Sixth Sense of Quantum Living, I encourage you to quickly download them and perhaps have a conscious quantum field podcast binge over one evening together with today's episode. I love movie and podcast binge. Whenever I can, I watch or listen to several episodes back to back to immerse myself in the topic. (laughs) I just love it. I can reveal that my next episode will also be in the same vein as I will be talking about the conscious universe with my special guest. Who? Well, you need to visit my website at quantumliving.com.au forward slash podcast to find out. Today's episode is a real treat as I have invited an expert in sound healing through biofield tuning. She is well known in the quantum healing circles and many of you might be familiar with her amazing work in this field. My special guest today is Aileen Day McCusick. Aileen is a pioneer in the field of the human biofield, therapeutic sound and electric health. A researcher, author, inventor, educator, speaker and practitioner, Aileen has been researching health since 1987 and specifically how sound impacts health since 1996. She is the originator of the sound therapy method Biofield Tuning with thousands of students trained worldwide since 2010, the founder of the Biofield Tuning Institute and author of the award-winning best-selling book Tuning the Human Biofield, Healing with Vibrational Sound Therapy, as well as the recently released Electric Body, Electric Health. Eileen is also the inventor of the revolutionary and much-loved tool, the Sonic Slider, the creator of a line of tuning forks and accessories, and the CEO of Biosona LLC, which provides sound therapy tools and training globally. And now Aileen joins me from Winooski in Vermont. Hello, Aileen. Welcome to Quantum Living. It's a pleasure to have you on my show. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Anna. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Beautiful. When we talk about energy healing, it is a fairly common knowledge that we can heal the body by clearing the chakras with Reiki, with Donna Eden's method of energy healing, with acupuncture and acupressure on the meridians and a number of other alternative therapies. But you took this one step further 
and combined the electric properties of the body's biofield with the multidimensional structure of our being, containing memories and other information, which is absolutely fascinating. So I am really looking forward to our conversation, and I just can't wait to hear your story. So to kick off our conversation, could you please share with us your journey? How did you get into vibrational healing? Well, I was on my own journey of healing and reading a lot of books. I'm definitely a researcher by nature and always have a stack of books that I'm in the process of working through. It's no different now than it was in 1996 when I discovered vibrational medicine. I think that it started probably by reading Deepak Chopra's book, uh, Quantum Healing, Mm. and discovering this idea that everything was vibration. And that made a lot of sense to me. It, it, the idea that everything with vibration resonated and I became interested in vibrational medicine. And I went out and I tried to find everything I could on the topic, a handful of books and some CDs, Jonathan Goldman and, um, John Beaulieu, guys who were in it early. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, just, I really loved the information. And as I got through my stack of books, I got a catalog in the mail, a Gaia catalog that had a set of tuning forks for healing in it. And so I was like, Oh, look at that, you know, vibrational medicine, sound healing. <laughs> so it worked on, on impulse. And at the time I had a part-time massage therapy practice. I also owned a very busy restaurant. Um, but I was trying to pursue my interest in education in health and wellness concurrently. And, uh, I had a few clients that I felt comfortable enough with to ask them to be guinea pigs that could I play with my new teening forks with you and let's just see what happens. And they came with this very tiny instruction book that said it, you, you use the note of C in the root chakra and the note of D in the sacral chakra. And so it's a C major scale. <clears throat> use it in the seven chakras. So that's what I did. I, I activated the note of C and I held it over, you know, the area of the root chakra. And I thought that it was going to sound like a C, like no matter where I put it, I'm like, C. <laughs> I thought that that's what was going to happen, but that's not what happened. What happened was depending on what part of the body I held a fork over, like if I passed it slowly over the body, it would change sometimes very dramatically. In some places it would go very sharp. In other places it would sound flat. Some places would sound like they were full of static or noise. Some areas the sound would get sucked in very quickly. It, you know, no matter, even if I hit it the same, with the same intensity, that it was like the body just went and sucked it up and the sound would disappear. Whereas in other places, the sound would get louder. Like it was, it was, did not behave the way I thought it would at all. And early on, when I was sharing these observations with people, they were saying it's room acoustics, it's the Doppler effect. Ah. It's like, I understand those ideas, but there's something else going on besides that, right? There's like, so what I know now, which I didn't know then, is that everything in the body is in motion and everything in motion makes waves and waves propagate. And we're all giving off vibes all the time, which we all know, you know, we've all had the experience of getting good vibes off people and bad vibes off people. Like we're vibe sensing and emitting antenna. Mm-hmm. And, and so even though the, the, what the waves of the body is producing are extremely high frequency, extremely low amplitude, the tuning fork. Also, we use aluminum tuning forks, which produce a lot of overtones and undertones. And so technically an infinite number of overtones. So the, the, those waves intersect and, and then that information propagates down through the octaves into the hearing range. So early on, I was working with somebody who had pain in their shoulder. And when I passed the tuning fork over the shoulder, it went really sharp and loud. And he said, that's kind of how my shoulder feels, right? So that the body was literally giving off like, ah, and you could hear it in the tuning fork. 
Um, but what was so interesting was that I kept on activating the fork and like bringing it back to that spot. And after a few strikes, it didn't sound so sharp and loud anymore. Like it, it modulated, it regulated and, and it softened. And when he got up off the table, he rotated his shoulder and he was like, Oh my God, it doesn't hurt at all anymore. And I was like, Oh wow. my God. <laughs> right? <laughs> Didn't expect that. <laughs> like, and so that that kind of um, just curiosity and exploration just kept revealing sort of one curious thing after another, as well as beneficial outcomes. And people would come back and say, do that sound thing on me again. And I pretty much stopped doing massage in short order and just started using um, the forks, but I was also in the beginning really informed by the whole idea of vibrational medicine. And so I wanted to use music and color as well. So I went out and I got hundred watt light bulbs in every color of the rainbow and a gooseneck lamp. And so when people would come in, I'd like kind of determine which chakra was the weakest and needed color and light. And so I would put the lamp on them and then I had a surround sound stereo with a subwoofer mm. under the table and I'd play selected musical pieces and then I'd do the tuning forks on top of it. I mean, I really went whole hog in the beginning, <laughs> um, <laughs> but in time I, you know, I kind of whittled it down to just the forks and discovered uh -huh. that. Um, I could get a lot of neat things done with them. So, um, so I did them as a hobby for 10 years and I had no real desire or intention to be a healer, especially like a sound healer. I mean, in 1996 in Connecticut, when I told people I was doing sound healing with tuning forks, I can't even tell you the degree of cynical skepticism <laughs> and dismissal that I encountered. I mean, it was really painful. <laughs> and uh, and I just didn't want to be subjected to that. And so I just kind of kept it as a hobby and a curiosity. And, you know, do one or two a week, you know, for years, just kind of playing around. Um, but then I made a discovery, like an accidental discovery in 2006 that just kind of changed everything um, and, and made me sort of come around to committing <laughs> to, you know, and the climate was changing in 2006. It changed a lot, like around 2012. And now, you know, 2022, nobody's mean anymore when they hear about <laughs> sound healing. They're curious, you know, it's, it's a much more yeah. kind environment to be a sound healer in now than it, than it was for a long time there. But uh, the discovery that I made in 2006 was Prior to that, I'd only been working right over the body. And I, I discovered that sometimes I'd find loud spots. Like if I was sort of scanning, you know, the root chakra, I'd find that the left hip, it's, it just sound really loud over the left hip, really quiet over the center and kind of quiet over the other hip. But there'd be this big loud spot, you know, over that hip. And I discovered that I could use the tuning fork like, like a magnetic stylus. Like that would be a pile of iron filings. And then with the tuning fork, I could do this thing that I call click, drag and drop, where I kind of like click into the loud spot with the tuning fork and then drag it to the chakra, right? This idea, well, that's an energy center. And like if, if it's loud as an indication of energy, it should be loud over the energy center, not over the hip, right? So I, I developed this little practice of like scanning the body, finding loud spots and like dragging them into wow. the center. And people were like, wow, I feel more centered. <laughs> like, like, cool. You know, but it would also like relieve pain. Like, you know, part of that loudness is that if you are, if your energy is imbalanced and you are running more electric energy through your right hip than the midline, that's too much voltage running through the wires. One of the causes of pain is just like overloading the circuitry, right? So if somebody was in pain, like the guy with the shoulder or these hip things, then by adjusting, this is what I know now, which I didn't know then, is that magnetic fields actually guide and inform electric currents. So the body has electric current running through it. We actually have an electrical system that we don't ever learn about. Like nobody knows they have an electrical system, but yet somehow everybody knows they have electricity in their body. <laughs> and most people are very disconnected from the idea that anything that has electric current in it has a magnetic field around it. Like that's just physics one-on-one, uh -huh. right? Their human body's no different. You know, some people will argue like, oh, it's really weak, yeah. you know? We're like, yeah, okay, it's weak, 
but it's still there. You know, the, the magnetic field is really weak. Yeah, but it's still there. Like it's there. You know, it's your aura, it's your human energy field, it's your bio field, it's your magnetic field, it's your electric current magnetic yeah. field. Like, I don't yes. even understand how people ever got so confused about this and like made to believe that it didn't exist. It's very strange to me because it's so obvious. Yes, when you kind of absolutely. Get it. You know? I didn't get it for a really long time because I'd never been taught about it. But now I know what I'm doing with the tuning force is manipulating the magnetic field that when I hold a vibrating tuning fork, it produces a weak electromagnetic charge that does make it like a magnet. And it allows me to manipulate and modulate the magnetic field, which then changes the way electricity is running through the body. Yes, extremely interesting. Now, something has occurred to me when you uh, when you were talking about moving with your tuning fork, the energy from one part, maybe at the edge of the body into the center, which then has changed the, the sound or vibration. What has occurred to me is that you are actually re-centering or centering the chakras. I am aware that many people have their chakras not centered. And in fact, some of the chakras are pushed over to one side or another, which obviously disrupts the proper flow of energy. So as we, as you were speaking to that, I just got that image of your tuning fork moving the displaced, if you like, chakra into its proper location to the center how does it resonate with you pun intended <laughs> that's exactly what we're doing i mean that's what's happening that is absolutely what's happening and, I, and i've come to see the electrical system the biofield this is all mind what we call conscious mind subconscious mind it's where all our memories are and and our, our proclivities so for example, if somebody has a tendency to overthink, to overdo, to always be busy, to always be out in front of themselves, they're going to pitch the energy of their hip to the right. So, so the, that chakra becomes unbalanced because their mind and their habits and their inner, inward occupation of themselves is all skewed. And their biofield is in a bunch, basically. And so they might start to develop right hip pain because the magnetic field is shifted there. It's drawing electric current there, but their mind, it's mind, wow. it's mental. So basically what I discovered was that in this model with the biofield, which is shaped like a torus, um, the body is actually inside the mind instead of the mind inside the body, like we're told right here in upside down where everything they tell us is wrong. Um, th this is a completely different model. And so when our mind goes out of balance, it, it pulls our energy, obviously, because it's one and the same, and our body out of balance as well. And the tuning forks allow us to find where these concentrations of imbalanced energy have ended up and actually like herd them back into the midline, back into alignment, back into the present moment, right? That's so a lot of like being centered, it's being in the now. Yes. So is this Newtonian science or quantum cosmology? <laughs> uh, it's physics. It's This is all uh, based in science we already understand. Um, tuning forks work. Remember I said initially when I first discovered where this person had pain, right? The tuning forks initially resonated with the signal that was present. But then they entrained it into a more coherent expression, right? That's resonance and entrainment. Yes. That's how the tuning forks work. That's how we they're diagnostic in a way because we find areas in the electrical system where the signal is, is out of whack or where there's a bunch of resistance in the flow. That's how we find it because it'll resonate with that distortion. But then the body is a self-tuning instrument. So when it hears and feels and senses itself being reflected as out of tune, just like when you look in the mirror and you haven't seen yourself in a while and your hair is a mess and you have 
I'll probably see it in your teeth. Like, you, what do you do? What does everybody do? <laughs> you immediately go to groom yourself, to put yourself in order, right? When the body hears itself, the body's organizing intelligence hears itself out of tune. It immediately uses the input. The tuning fork is like a mirror. It's like a metronome. And it's like a magnet. <laughs> and, and the body uses all of those inputs to correct itself because we're designed to be in harmony. Yes. And it's just, and it can be as oddly simple as just the body hearing itself through a tuning fork as being, wow, like that's not good. It, it, it might have known it was out of whack there, but it didn't have the support or the reflection or the environment in which to self correct. Right. Yes. You talk to the body hearing itself. Could you elaborate on that for our listeners who are perhaps less familiar with this topic? in terms of the body's intelligence. Yeah. Well, you know, you and I were talking earlier uh, before we started recording about how I was in a motorcycle accident a few months ago and I fractured the outside of my left ankle. Well, that healed on its own. I didn't need a splint. I didn't need a cast. It's just like my body just fixed it. You know, it's like, oh, there's something broken here. <laughs> let's, let's repair um, I skinned my knee, you know, it's scabbed over and then it healed. Like I didn't have to direct any of that consciously. Our bodies are brilliant. I and mean, if I've learned anything in, in 26 years of practice, it's that we have ridiculously dumb software operating in incredibly sophisticated hardware. Our bodies are blow me away <laughs> with their intelligence and and their ability to continually self-repair. You know, you think, look at the kind of food we put them in, put in them and the stress we put them under. And I was just so amazed to watch my body heal. Um, so th that organizing intelligence, you know, that is directing all of that always wants to fix things, always wants to, it's like its job to keep things in order, right? Yeah. And so went this, you know, curious thing that I discovered that if I'm three feet away from someplace where you have pain and I activate a tuning fork, it's like sonar. I'm bouncing sound off the body and listening to the ping back. But that also gives the body the opportunity to hear the ping back. Yes. It is um, often said that the body always wants to heal itself if we allow it. So just like with with diet, with with the lifestyle, if we keep bombarding our body with unhealthy foods and, and and unhealthy substances, and we have unhealthy lifestyle, this makes it so much harder to bo for the body to come back into the equilibrium, which is exactly what what you were talking about. Now, I'm curious when you are working with a client or even working on yourself with your tuning forks. Are you getting any insights from other than the behavior or the sound of your tuning forks? Are you getting any, if you like, psychic insight from the quantum field as to what to do, which part of the body to go to, etc.? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's all. That's it. You know, there's nothing else other than that. Okay. Yeah. I mean, in the beginning, I... Especially when I, well, in 2006, what happened was I discovered a loud spot three feet away from someone, totally by accident. <laughs> I, I ended up walking away from a table. And when I was walking back, for whatever reason, I activated the fork kind of like six feet away from them. And I was walking back towards them with the fork uh, ringing and I hit a loud spot and the fork went through it and it came out the other side and it quieted down. And I was like, what was that? <laughs> I went back and I'm like, there's a loud spot. Like, you know, about this big wow. out here. And <laughs> and so I wasn't sure what to do with it. But what I'd been doing was bringing everything to center, right? So I was like, well, let me just bring it to center. And it was like, felt really weird to like stick a fork in this loud spot out here and like drag it to the midline of the body. But when I got there, I like really got sucked in. The throat was much louder. And then you know, the loud spot was gone from here. And then the person called me the next day and told me that, that what she had been suffering from was completely gone. And she tried lots of other approaches and nothing had helped. And then me accidentally like finding wow. this and, and adjusting it solved her problem, <laughs> which blew us both away. And so the next people that came in, I started investigating. Like I started about as far away in the room as I could. And I started 
combing in and I discovered that there was this whole tonal and textural landscape around the body, like hidden in plain view. There was this whole world um, like like a, a tonal landscape and the tuning fork was like an invisible ink decoder and it allowed me to start to observe that there were patterns present that there were that there were tonal patterns that there were textural patterns and I started what I call the biofield anatomy map began to emerge and it took about three or four years of you know working with people um, and and just observing it was really just pattern observation but so a number of things about it were kind of strange. So one was in the very beginning when I first started exploring and had no idea what I was exploring, I would hit these spots and it was like, um, I had a, a little, what I call a male slot, M-A-I-L slot, where my, at the atlas bone where the spine joins the skull, C1. Um, and it's like, and it's like little notes would drop in, <laughs> like the mouth side open and like a little note would drop in <laughs> and it would say something like sadness age 14. And I would say to the person, something really sad happened when you were 14 and they would be like, Oh yeah, that's my grandmother died and da -da -da. Uh, right. And so every wow. time you would hit these strange sounding areas where I'm like listening, I'd get a mail drop and it would say, this is this. And then I would ask the person and they would be, they would absolutely confer it. So where was that information coming from? I don't know. You know, that's why I refer to it as my mail slot. Cause I'm not a guides kind of gal. And I just, you know, there's certain things we just can't know and I'm okay with not knowing. <laughs> you know what I mean, I don't need to name it. It like came in the mail slot. The mail slot is clued in and I trust it. And that's just, you know, kind of how I operate. So, um, so what started as just coming in from the blue, uh, correctly, May, in time made me realize that there was a pattern there. It, it revealed the anatomy and that got brought me to the point where I didn't need the mail slot. I was just recognizing like this sound in this area is this kind of memory. And I learned what I call the language of vibration um, in great detail. So every single emotion we feel produces a different sound in our field here in the fork like even sadness there's all these different iterations of sadness there's like loneliness or abandonment or grief or keen or wailing shades of sadness <laughs> so many shades of sadness yeah different shades of anger you know there's um certainly different uh, dimensions of joy and grace and uh you know uh, there's there's all, all of it is all a tonal that is expressed in this very subtle way in our body um, even every pathology makes a particular tone. Uh, an arthritic joint, when you bounce sound off of an arthritic joint, it produces like a grainy kind of quality, whereas a non-arthritic joint doesn't have that. Fatty liver has a very different sound than a healthy liver, right? And this is all, this is all sonar. This is just like, or, or even like ultrasound, how ultrasound bounces yeah. weight stuff and then forms a picture um this is the same thing this stuff is all present it's not visible to our eye but it doesn't mean that it's not there and filled with information Absolutely. and and so i've been able to like decode the patterning of our minds find specific memories that still have charge reflect that memory and that in tonal information back to the body and the body goes well i don't need to be all like whoa about that anymore and what will happen is as the body hears itself in that distortion, it relaxes. Mm. That's how the distortion leaves the signal is the body recognizes there's some kind of car alarm going off over in that spot. It's like, whoa, what do I have to release or relax so that that's not making noise anymore? Wow. So really what this work is, is it's just a process of relaxing subconscious tension so that the body can then fix itself. I mean, it's really that simple. So it's, you know, it's all pretty Newtonian, you know, but it was informed by uh, what well, something we might call it esoteric. I mean, intuition, is it really that far out? I don't think so. <laughs> This is a mind-blowing, pioneering work.
It is absolutely mind blowing. And it does make sense because it is scientifically based. We are energy bodies. And so it does make perfect sense. But I am absolutely convinced, maybe you are not, but I, <laughs> but I, I feel that you are absolutely connecting with the person's energy field, with their unconscious mind, and the insight or the information that you are getting about specific areas of the body or, or specific traumas trapped in the biofield are coming from the, from the person's unconscious mind, which is where they are originating from, or potentially from the quantum field, from the universal mind, from the universal library. Yeah, I mean, it's all one and the same. I mean, that's what I really discovered is that our own personal Akashic record is one and the same. It's embedded in the universe. Oh, thank you for mentioning record. Akashic records. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, when I was, when I sort of read the field, person's field and be like, oh my God, this is where the memories are. And yet, look, it's here in space. Yes. Right? It's not embedded in the brain. It's here in, it's waves in space. It's part of the larger one field where all the information is. And this is no longer pseudoscience or, you know, psychic woo-woo, or as some people might feel. This is, this is a, a, an absolute intersection of science and spirituality, you know, which, which is the dimension that I, that I am exploring because I just love it. But it makes so much sense. And you can't really refute it because that's what's actually happening. And so I feel that one, um, important aspect amongst many other important aspects of your work in terms of propagating it and, and teaching it is to take it out of the shadows of pseudoscience to into the light of quantum science, quantum physics, which overlaps with esoteric knowledge because this is just one and the same pretty much, and to encourage people to look into it, to try it and to use it, because if it brings such great um, uh, outcomes and benefits, then why not? And this leads me to my next question. Are the outcomes and benefits of biofield tuning physical, emotional, mental, or even spiritual? And can anything be healed? The outcomes are all, all of those things. What, what this work does is it gets you to relax. Like this, this is just very, very simple. It's like you're tense because you've had trauma or bad inputs or you've got difficult things going on in your life. It's making you not breathe. It's making you tense up. If you had a lot of trauma as a child, you have a tremendous amount of deep tension in your body. I certainly did from the way that I grew up. Uh, so much tension. And when you have that kind of restriction, you get inflammation, your body starts to break down because trash isn't getting taken out, nutrients aren't getting in because there's just too much tension. And so by releasing the tension, by helping the body to just go, oh, <sighs> whatever energy was sequestered in that tension has now gone into flow. So our potential is all tied up in our tension. And the more we, it's like you could, Eckhart told him, I call mm. your pain body. It's where all your tension is. What's your light body? Oh, once that tension releases yes. and everything's flowing, that's your light body. So, so if you have pain, you know, physical pain, you, you have too much tension over there, right? If you have mental imbalance, mm -hmm. there's, you know, it's usually mental imbalance is usually the consequence of suppressing some kind of emotion. Most of us are sick because we've been raised in an abstinence only environment when it comes to emotions. Like we're, we're suffering from an inability and a lack of expression. People don't sing, people don't dance, people do all the things that tribal humans were always like making noise and bouncing around and we're like scrolling and wondering why we don't feel good, you know? Yeah. So, so mental, emotional, spiritual, I mean, to me, what I've come to see is that our body's electrical system, right? When you're alive, your light is on. When you die, your light goes out. To me, that's your soul. To me, your electrical system and your mm. soul are one and the same. 
So there's no separating this science and spirituality nonsense. Like, I don't even think we should speak that kind of language. It just continues to speak to this nonsense story that wants to disempower us, that doesn't want us to know that the, the light that powers me is one with all light. You can't separate light. Like it's all one light and I'm just a drop of it, right? And our strength is in our connection because the more light you bring together, even through the ether or the quantum field, the more power you build. But if you don't know you, if you're told you don't have a soul and you're told never told you have an electrical system, then you've got this weird science, spirituality, crazy thing going on that isn't even necessary because it's all answered very simply with your electrical system. And, Absolutely. Right. And it makes sense as far as like reincarnation goes, because if all your memories and every experience you have is stored in your electrical system, right, because everything you see and smell and touch and taste and feel, it's all electrical impulses. Yeah. So it makes sense that it's all stored in your electrical yes. system. And then you take it with you when you go. So that's your karma going with you. <laughs> or clear it while you are here or clear it while you're here and that's so that's definitely something that we do right so sometimes i might work with somebody who has something that's physical that's progressed that's beyond my wheelhouse to fix mm -hmm. but i can still help them clean their karma clean their soul get into forgiveness forgive themselves get their 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 light body in order so that they don't have to carry that karma <laughs> with them when they go. Yeah. So there's always something that can be healed. Absolutely. So could you explain what happens during a typical biofield tuning session? Maybe pick a couple of examples or even a couple of interesting case studies and just take us through the process, if you would. Okay. Well, I worked with somebody today who... Uh, I mean, has a very hard knock story uh, for a lot of different reasons, right? And you'd be surprised. I mean, you see people walking down the street and you're like, oh, there's a person who looks normal. Oh my God, <laughs> read their field and their memories and their history and what people go through. You know, what they've been through just never fails to blow me away. And that that, that, that person can have that hard of a life and still come walk into the office and be pleasant and like seem like a normal human being. We're so resilient. So um, this particular person was telling me a story about how one of her siblings, her brother, um, had gotten very angry at her and he had been really yelling at her a lot for something that she did and how she was doing her best to be compassionate and to forgive him. And I'm listening with the forks to what's going on. I'm listening to her system. And, uh, and I realize that she hates him, that, that she hated him when, for things he did when they were younger and she was hating him right then and there. Mm. But here's a really interesting thing. We're so uncomfortable with when I start bring up hate, people get so uncomfortable. They're like, oh, I don't hate. Like, I don't hate anything. I don't hate anybody. Like, I'm spiritual. I don't hate. Like, hate is like the worst emotion you can feel. Like, you can, you know, shame, whatever. No, hate. Hate is the one that makes people the most uncomfortable. Because all of us, especially ladies, were told growing up, like, hate is a very strong word. Like, don't hate. No, 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 no hating. No hating. Well, you know what? Hate yeah. is a natural response. It's a natural human emotion that comes up when we're powerless, when we're afraid, when, you know, like when we're angry, like all of those things coalesce into hate. And it's okay to hate. It's okay to feel any of our emotions because we feel them. It's like part of being human, right? But she had never allowed her, she never given herself permission to feel that feeling. Mm. And so she had internalized it. She'd stuffed all. She was actually so bound up in her right hip and her right leg. She, she was suffering with all of this tension in her body. And it was because she was trying so hard to be good and nice and, and spiritual and not indulge, like not hate. And, you know, and I gave her permission to hate. I'm like, you yeah, hate him. Then, but here's the thing. Okay. This is what people do. They divide themselves into either or. Well, I'm either spiritual and forgiving, but then if I'm hating him, then I lose that, that spiritual forgiveness. And I was like, nonsense. You don't lose that. You are that. Like, you, of course, you are a big, 
hearted spiritual person who obviously sees beyond and can have compassion, but you're also a human being having a human experience. And he did things and hate is a valid yeah. response. An emotion is a wave. It rises up, it crests. Ideally it gets expressed and then it falls away. But she had resisted every wave of hate from ever breaking out of her mm. because of the, because she judged it. Right. And people like that, when you won't let yourself hate others, where does it go? It goes into self-hatred. It goes into self-loathing because that's the only thing that's safe to hate is yourself. Yes. Right. So, so I heard what was going on in her system. I gave her permission to feel it. And, 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 and she was able to make the connection between the tension in her body and what she'd been suffering with, with how much she'd been holding back her true emotions out of this fear that she couldn't be both. I was like, you can be both. You can, you can be having the wave of emotion inside your expanded self. You can be compassionate and angry at the same time. It's okay. You're not sacrificing one for the other. So what happened? She had this huge release in her hip. Wow. In one yeah. session. In one session. One session. So this is interesting. Uh, does the person need to go into the emotion that you have discovered? Do they need to feel it during the session or it doesn't matter? Well, everybody's different, right? So it, it's hard to answer a question like that. Like if somebody's done a lot of work around a particular emotion or pattern. You know, like I was abandoned, I was abandoned, I was abandoned, I was abandoned. I've been sad, I've been sad. Well, I've done a lot of work and talking around that and I feel pretty healed, right? But I'm going to go in and I'm going to read the record as it was laid down. And I'm going to hear all this abandonment. And you're going to say, but I thought I worked through that. <laughs> I'm going to be like, this is not your adult perspective. This is the track as it was laid down. This is the needle laid down this record of everything that you felt. And that's what I'm reading. So if somebody's done a lot of work and they really have forgiven and they really have let go the, the record will shift much more easily. But I've come across things like where, uh, you know, how sometimes if somebody grew up with a really bad parent and they're like, do all the work and all the focus around the bad parent. And then one day they discover that w the good parent was actually also a bad parent, but they didn't realize it. Right. <laughs> so I've like done all this work around this parent, but oh, we're getting into this. Parent. Like, oh, wow. I never even thought about that or that, you know, <laughs> just as an example, I mean, everybody's parents obviously do the best job they can, but, um, so, so some, some sessions, you know, one can just be very, very dramatic because, but it also depends on where the person is ready to go. Do you know what I mean? Like I'm not healing them. I'm just holding up yeah. a mirror and like listening to what's going on. And because I understand the language, I can say, this is going on, this is going on, but we're watching your body work with the signal. Mm. Right. So you and I don't have to intend anything. If I'm doing a session on you, like mostly I've been doing distance. Um, I just activate the fork and listen. And then I give commentary on what I'm noticing. And then I invite you to give commentary on what you're noticing. But, but what's really happening is your organizing intelligence is working with a fork and that's what's happening. Right. We're just letting that happen. So you facilitate the healing, which brings me to my next question. When you are dealing with this, effectively, this negative energy trapped in the body field somewhere, do you release it from the body or do you allow your body to dissolve it, dissipate it, do whatever the body wants to do with it? Or do you direct what is going to happen with it? Both. <laughs> so, okay. So... In some cases, people will attract or accumulate thought forms that are not self. Um, you know, mm -hmm. and it can be, I don't know, I just keep it simple and call it not self. Yeah. And sometimes I can come across something and feels like, oh, this is just not self. 
This might be somebody else's energy or thinking about somebody or just some thought form you picked up. And so those things we draw away from the body. I'm just like, oh, let's just get that off. I worked on um, one of my, my girlfriends who's Indian and the, in the Indian culture, the concept of personal space is really different. And, you know, families, especially they all cluster very close together. And, and her field was filled with ancestors that were all clustered in very closely. And I had to, and I had to kind of get them out. I'm like, she's American. <laughs> you have more space around you. Like, you know, you're not, uh, that was one thing that I did yeah. one time. Um, but most of what we encounter isn't what I would call negative energy. What it, it's all just energy. It's all light. There's no such thing really in the, you know, mm -hmm. maybe there is as negative energy there, there probably is, but not in this case, what it just is, is your light kind of trapped in a chaotic pattern because of the experience that you had. So, you know, was your dad beating you with a belt, like a negative input? Yeah. Right. What did it make you do? Tense and like feel like this. So, so your needle is printing out something like this and you're not breathing and you're clenching. Right. So in your memory bank, the, that energy is frozen and it's in this chaotic pattern. So when I'm finding stuff stuck in your field, it's not negative. It's just trapped in a, you know, an unfortunate pattern. But by staying in that spot and reflecting it back to the body, the body relaxes. So that pattern that's holding it, like just kind of dissolves back into harmony. And the, the light that was frozen there decouples from that pattern. And so we, we're just bringing light back into the body. We're not bringing negative energy or anything like that. We're just letting the body know whenever you have a lot of tension in different areas over time, you develop cell poop, like waste accumulates. And, and so when you relax, mm -hmm. whatever kind of debris was in those cells where there was tension and very often there's emotional you know, molecules of emotion as well. Candace Burt discovered every time you feel an emotion, mm -hmm. you create a molecule that's resonating with that vibe, right? Yeah. Um, so you might have been stuffing a whole bunch of, of sadness. And then when I release that pattern from your field, all of that sadness comes out of your cells. And you might have a day where you feel discombobulated or you're having waves of sadness or crying going on because your body is digesting and cycling those emotions this is, you know, pretty normal to have a, an emotional or vulnerable day after a session because your body's like rearranging the furniture and cleaning up. And like, we just moved around the blueprint. And now there's all this stuff that, you know, has to happen in the wake of it. But once that passes, mm. you feel better. You feel lighter. Basically what everybody says is I feel lighter. I feel lighter. And my husband's like, can you come up with a more scientific word? than that? <laughs> <laughs> well it is scientific lighter it's lighter yeah because what was heavy when it's out in your field it's like heavy and stuck and then when you release it it comes in and then it's lighter and you just you just feel lighter and come to think of it lighter is not only having less weight to it but having more light exactly lighter so this is both meaning less heavy and having more light. They just came to yeah, me. Yeah, no, now. that's exactly what it is. It's both of those. Yeah. <laughs> just, just now. Beautiful. Okay. Now you mentioned a few times that you do those sessions remotely. Yeah. How does it work? Exactly. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's, a good, it's a really good question. Um, I didn't think it would work. You know, for a number of years, people asked me if I could do my work remotely. And I always <laughs> sort of scoffed arrogantly. <laughs> I was like, no, no, I can't. Uh, this is physics. You know, I, this is sound waves on the body I, is not something I do remotely. Um, but then a colleague of mine, an MD who lives in California, convinced me to try a distance session on him. And I am a scientist and a researcher, and I do love experiments. So even though I did not believe it was possible, I was willing to try the experiment. And in my practice, I have people come in, lie down, fully clothed on a treatment table. And at that time, I was scanning the entire field and adjusting the entire field. 
and could read the the field at that time. And so uh, I pretended that he was on my table and I approached it as if he was. I started to move my forks through the field and much to my amazement, the pattern of energy and information that shows up when someone is on the table showed wow. up when he was not on the table. And he did not have an open line of communication. So I took notes. I went through, I scanned and adjusted his whole field. And, and then we got on the phone and I went through my notes and I told him uh, the age where he moved, the personality of his mother, that he had a head injury when he was five, that he had inflammation in his left shoulder, that his spleen and pancreas weren't working quite right and were off rhythm. <laughs> you know, like basically all the things, like the ages where, like, you know, everything that I'd be able to tell someone in person, I read and wrote down. And I was kind of amazed. I was like, I can't even believe that I'm doing this and I'm not even sure that I'm right, but I'm just going to trust my impressions. And, and so I read my notes and he said, Eileen, that is all exactly correct. And he said, and I felt you working on me and I felt a state change and I measured my blood sugar wow. before and after and it's different. And I was like, wow, <laughs> like, I had to eat because I've been very kind of adamant that it was impossible, you know? So I didn't even believe it was possible going into it. It's not like I was like, oh, I want this to be possible. And I, I was like, this isn't going to work. And so and when it did, like, I was truly uh, astonished and humbled. Um, and then I just started doing more of them. And what it did was it forced me to listen even more deeply into understanding the language of vibration because I didn't have somebody there to correlate. Like, did you move when you were 13? You know? I'm like, okay, this sounds like a move. This sounds like a heartbreak. This sounds like um, a bad relationship. You know, there's, there's all these different things that we experience that we put words on, but really they're feelings. So how do you connect remotely with one specific person? Do you actually need to visualize the person? Do you need to know their name and date of birth and their location? How do you connect with them? Say, if I were to call you from Melbourne, how would you connect with me? Zoom. <laughs> That's how I'd connect. I connect via Zoom. But if we weren't connecting via Zoom, and if we were just connecting via intention, like I did in the beginning, because I stopped doing that, it forced me to learn the language even better. But I found that I preferred working with an open line of communication. But all I would need to know is Anna and how old you are so I can read your timeline correctly. Okay. And so people get really elaborate and they put down crystals and they use maps or pictures or this. I am a shortcut Shirley. Like I will not do a single step if it is not necessary. And so I'm just like, Shirley, you know, I'm just like, Anna's right here. And I'm working on her. I don't, I don't like do any extra steps. It's as simple as Anna. Here we go. <laughs> you know, other people might want to do it others, but here's what I've learned. Okay. Anna, have you ever had the experience of suddenly thinking of a friend or maybe a lover or somebody close to you? Like you suddenly think of them and then you go over and you pick up your phone and they text you in that moment or they had Absolutely. texted you. Okay? Right. Because, because, because we're connected, right? That's how I work on people at a distance. Ah, uh, absolutely. That's the bottom line that there's just one quantum field and we are interconnected. Exactly. But I was curious whether you you need to have a location because I've been speaking with some remote healers who need the location, the, like the physical location of the person in order to tune into them. But you said you don't need that necessarily. I think that's just a limitation they're putting on themselves, quite frankly. I don't need a location. Okay. You know, you're in the you're in the field. That's all I need to know. You are a, a transmitter and a receiver. You are an antenna. We are connected no matter where we are. I don't need to know where you are. So the connection is the intention. It's the intention. Beautiful. Oh, I'm mm -hmm. loving it. This is such an elegant model, such an elegant methodology and modality and so effective that, and I'm just going back to your earlier point, that it is mind-blowing on one hand that it is so amazingly simple and effective. And on the other hand, why not everyone recognizes it and why isn't it used widely? Which brings me to my next question now. You teach biofield tuning, 
and you teach it through your classes and workshops, etc. But before we we get to uh, to your offerings and your services, could you please talk to the concept of teaching this this modality? Let's call it modality. Can anyone learn it? Can people learn it again remotely? Do they need to come to your institute? So how does it work? Well, you know, it's really interesting. Um, my very first class of students was in 2010, and I was working on my master's in education. It was my plan to get my master's in education before I started teaching. But I had a group of clients and friends who pretty much bullied me, 10 of them, into starting a class and teaching them. And I told one of my brothers that I was going to teach this class. And he said, can other people learn to do what you do? And I was like, I don't know, <laughs> we're going to find out. And what I found was that people learned it very easily. The, the, this idea of combing through the field and feeling and sensing when you've hit distortions, that if you go slow enough and you're quiet enough inside and you're just paying attention to your senses and you're not worrying if you can do it or not, that you just feel, you feel when you hit an area that the vibration feels different. You're like, oh, this is more vibrating. I'm like, yeah, okay, then just stay there. And just stay there and keep going back there until it's not more vibrating and then move on. Like, it's so simple. I'd say, we're, you know, you don't have to think of yourself as a healer or anything. You're just a technician. All you're doing is combing through the field, finding the noise and resistance, staying there until it releases, moving to the next spot. Bring everything to the midline, drop it in, and then we do what we call columning, focusing it. So the whole work is just, it's really just moving in a plane towards the body to the midline and then moving from the midline up towards the ceiling. And that's it. You know, people are always like, what do you do to treat this? Or what do you do to treat that? I'm like, you go, whoop, whoop. That's <laughs> what you do. <laughs> and obviously, uh, a deeper understanding of the process comes with practice, just like everything else, I, I would say. Yes. Yes. And that's the thing. It's yes, there's a whole language here, but you can take any person, drop them in a foreign country and they're going to learn the language. Mm. It's the same with this oh. tuning. Anybody Al almost, who, almost, <laughs> almost, that's right. Almost anybody who, who continues to do it. And that's all it is. If you keep having the experience of doing it, you keep having the experience of learning. It teaches you. And I think this is what myself and all of the practitioners that I know, that the work teaches us all the time. That when you enter into that state of listening, of paying attention, of caring, insight drops in, understanding drops in, ahas drop in, seeing, knowing, being able to, to hear and reflect to be present with people because we get into people's stuff. Like you can't hide from the forks, you know, you can't, you can't, the forks are going to find it and they're going to reveal just how bad it was. And I'm going to listen to that with you. And you don't need to say a word for me to understand your suffering. So you get witnessed in this very deep and pure way. That, that I get to be there with whatever your pain was. When I find that with a fork and I'm resonating with it and we kind of ascertain what it is, I, I'm i seeing you. I'm hearing you, right? And, and people always say, this is so validating. Mm. This is so validating. I feel so seen. I feel so heard. I feel so understood, right? And then what's so cool, the best part of it all is, is that once the noise and the resistance dies down and the pure true tone that's underneath gets amplified, it's beautiful. Like I've yet to come across a soul that wasn't just so beautiful. You know, like our childlike nature is so sunshiny, right? I mean, the vast majority of little kids, they're just full of light, full of God, full of play and curiosity. And life takes that out of us. And all those little bits of spark get lost in the path mm. along the way, but we didn't really lose them. They're still in the field. And so, so much of what I do is inner child rescuing, honestly, like let's go find that four-year-old and like reintegrate her back into the scene. And she's frozen back in time and terror because of her environment. You know, we do leave pieces of ourselves behind, but the beauty is, is that we can go and pick them up and bring them back. And you no, know, it is like a soul retrieval, but it's more like, 
combing through your memory banks and literally finding the, the energy, the literal energy that is stuck in that literal memory and liberate. Absolutely. Speaking of teaching and learning, I would like to clarify my comment that almost everyone can learn a language when you drop them in a foreign country. And my qualification is everyone who wants to. Okay. Because if someone says, oh, you know, I don't care, can't be bothered, whatever, obviously. <laughs> so there needs to be, you know, again, an intention that, yes, I want to learn the language or I want to learn this, you know, A, B, C, whatever there is. And I'm prepared to to put into the required time and effort in order to achieve what I want. You've been teaching students for what now, about 22 years from memory of your bio? Uh, 12, 2010. Okay. For the past 12 years. So I assume that you keep in touch with your students once they have finished the program and they and they went on with their own practice based on their feedback. And perhaps this is a difficult question to answer. So if you can't answer, that's fine. But to what level of the skill of the mastery would you say the majority of them would come up to. So for example, if you are the benchmark of 100%, to what level do your students come? 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, on average, on average. You know what you're making me, yeah, you're, you know what you're making me think of is this one time, and this is probably like 2013 when I was teaching an early class and, uh, and I had, I was premenstrual. <laughs> I was tired. <laughs> I just taught them this wonderful method that this, what I call a sonic meridian flush and everybody ended the class and they all looked and felt fabulous and were in great shape. And I was just like, <laughs> <laughs> I, I went home and I said to my husband, I'm teaching them everything I know and it's going to add to everything they know and they're going to be smarter than me. And my husband said to me, isn't the students supposed to surpass the teacher? Mm. And I said, yes, but it hurts. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm hoping they surpass me, honestly. I mean, I certainly there's something to be said for being a pioneer and having the most amount of hours in. Mm. Um, but they get to build, you know, on what I've learned with their own dimensions of exploration on top of their own studies. You know, I've had a lot of students out there who are continuing education junkies who've learned so much about other things. And they're combining this work with Chinese medicine mm -hmm. and with, you know, other magical things that are out there, you know, um, and, and coming up with very cool stuff. So, mm. uh, you know, and. <laughs> And my longtime students, when I get worked on by them, mm -hmm. like if I have a group of 11 teachers, it's like being worked on by myself. I mean, I don't feel like I'm at a level superior to them. I mean, I might be a quicker study sometimes or I know things, but in their ability to hear and see and reflect and be present and understand, people come up to speed, you know, surprisingly quickly because you learn in every single session you do, like every single session you learn. I'm still learning. I'm still learning. Mm. Oh, absolutely. I would be surprised if you didn't because that's um, that's an evolving knowledge, if, even at your level of experience. Beautiful. So Aileen, I understand that you would be happy to give us a live demo of your tuning forks. So uh, would you like to tell us about what you are going to to do and and then do it <laughs> sure i can do that so i've got um i've got my my kit here next to me and I, I don't use a ton of forks so at one point in my practice i used up to 30 forks in in most sessions um now i use about six mm -hmm. that's about it um i really discovered that less is more and that you know with sound healing 
Uh, it's one of those fields that's really easy to get carried away and buy 10 million instruments. But I'll tell you, for, for somebody on the receiving end, uh, when I'm receiving a sound healing session, if somebody keeps switching forks or switching instruments, like with rapid succession, it's not helpful. It's not helpful. And so I really found there's something to be said for staying longer with just a few an assortment of a few tools rather than giving people the smorgasbord of sound. Um, that's just my experience as a receiver. So, uh, you know, certainly other people might have different opinions, but mm -hmm. I find less is more in, in this case. Yeah. I agree with you generally, by the way, that less is more. I think this is a very good guidance. Yeah. Yeah. I just, you know, there, there's some, some schools that, uh, of tuning forks that have you buy like lots and lots of them. And I was like, you know, people don't need all that stuff and carrying around mm -hmm. all that stuff, all that expensive stuff. Like <laughs> let's do as much as we can with as little as possible. Um, you know, and that's, that's my approach with everything. Minimum investment, maximum return, maximum efficiency. Like the, I own a really busy restaurant for 13 years. So I'm like, don't waste any steps or energy because, you know, Gotta like get it done. And so biofield tuning very much reflects that. It's very efficient. It gets right into it. It gets it done. It figures out what's going on. And it, you know, it doesn't, we don't fluff around unnecessarily. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So I'm just going to do like a little assortment of forks mm -hmm. that we'll listen mm -hmm. to and we'll just see what happens. So when I do sessions on somebody, like if I was going to be working on you, Anna, um, I would start off just listening. Right. So the first thing with sound healing is we listen first. We don't go in with any perceived notion like, okay, here we go with the sound. <laughs> you know, it's not about that. It's about really just paying attention, listening. What does the body want to tell me? What, what is that? What's, what's happening here? Right. And how can I listen to it? Um, same with if I work on a group. So since you've got a podcast here, you have a set of listeners, everyone who will ever listen to this recording, right? Creates mm -hmm. a field, a group field. You're going to show up and be like, wow, I'm paying attention. So the way that it works in, you know, in what you call a quantum field, I call the ether. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's, we're talking about the same thing, the essential oneness, you know, that all the, yeah. the implicate reality that all explicate reality arises from and sinks back into. It's all the same fabric of life, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, so I'm just going to listen. Oh, I was going to say time and space doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. You know, sometimes people are like, well, how does this work? I'm like, well, have you ever listened to like a beautiful recording of music that really moved you? People are like, yeah, of course. I was like, did you have to be there when it was recorded? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, no, sound moves <laughs> us. No matter when you hear it, no matter where you hear it, sound yeah. moves us. And, and, and it touches all of us. It doesn't matter if you weren't there alive. Okay. So this is all, this is all we're doing is using sound to move us. Um, but we're going to listen to it first. So I'm just going to listen to the group. I'm going to listen to everybody who's, who's ever going to listen. We're just going to spend a few moments. I'm going to activate the fork a few times. And I'm going to tell you what I hear. Okay. So first take a breath into the belly and exhale down into the ground. Use your mind and your imagination to, to send the energy of the exhale to direct it into the ground. This is what we call centering and grounding breath and biofield tuning, breathing into the belly, exhaling into the ground, right? So remember, we're working, this is to relax you, to make you lighter and to make you breathe more freely. So if at any point you become aware, like if something's welling up in you, it might just be that you need to take a big breath and blow it out and making that sound on the exhale helps discharge the vagus nerve. So just pay attention to your breath. I'll probably breathe like that. You might want to, and people listening, you know, breathe if you need to for sure. Okay, here we go. Okay, so what I hear, uh, first sound is usually kind of like a handshake. Second sound is gets kind of more into it. What I hear in that second tone is tension, like across the head, uh, in the jaw, just kind of like overload, even device overload, like EMF overload, kind of creating tension behind the eyes in the jaw. So, you know, that's something that I'm noticing. So 
Um, but what the sound does is it goes into where that tension is and it starts to open up space. So, you know, whether you feel it, feel that tension, like where I described it or somewhere else in the shoulders, you know, in Oh my God, I just felt it. What? Around my head opening up. Oh my God. Right? Oh, that's making my jaw want to open. And I, well, I was startling. <laughs> I can actually feel. I actually felt it. It's like yeah, opening like that, right? Yeah. Now the tone sounds bigger and brighter and more open. So just in those few strikes, we identified a pattern of tension. The sound started to go in and open. Then tone totally changed and is much more open now, right? And I feel it. I feel a kind of an opening and a lifting in my head, right? And you, I can see it in you, Anna. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. So that. That's just like a little micro wow. moment of what is possible, right? Um, so that was 174 hertz. So this is my kind of favorite teeny fork, my kind of go-to workhorse fork. Um, this next fork I'm going to use, and we'll just do the same thing again. We'll just listen, see kind of what shows up, see what happens in the in the wake of identifying it. Just before you do that, what do you strike it with? Because we don't have a video. So What I'm using as an activator is a hockey puck. Uh, specifically a Canadian hockey puck, Viceroy hockey puck. They're the best um, because they've got a lot of rubber in them. Less expensive, like uh, Czechoslovakian pucks have plastic in them. So it's very important to have a good Canadian hockey puck to activate your tuning forks against. Um, so this next fork is 144 hertz, and this is one that I most recently created because I found when COVID hit, and in the years, you know, in the last couple years, that the ether became thick with fear, with um, with medicines, <laughs> and uh, and my um, the forks that I was using like weren't quite cutting it on everybody. I was like, I need a bigger gun than the 174, and I created the 144, and it is the gun that I was hoping for, thankfully. But it makes a lot of weird sounds. So it might sound jarring or unpleasant to listeners, um, but it will it will probably harmonize. So uh, let's just listen in and see what we notice. Okay, this one is keying into a stiffness behind the shoulders, like between the shoulder blades and also the diaphragm. Um, so as soon as I started listening into it, my shoulders wanted to wiggle and my breath wanted to open. Um, but I'm just going to keep on sounding it and just keep seeing what you notice. Um, I'm also hearing like kvetching or moaning or complaining. Um, there's a kind of <laughs> kind of kind of sound going on in there, um, combined with just kind of like a general sort of achy achiness, um, and and a, and a slightly dull. Oh, and heat. I had heat releasing as well. So that sort of bitching and moaning and you know, but being hot and discontented. <laughs> it's all. Kind of showing up in that. <sighs> From the moment you started, I felt it opening my chest area, my heart center. Yeah. But not just the heart center, the whole, like from the center yeah. across shoulders, this, the whole area. I actually, and 
By the way, I don't know whether it matters or not, probably doesn't matter, but I am actually very sensitive to energy, like generally speaking. So maybe that's why I can feel it so distinctly, but I immediately started feeling opening of my chest area. Yeah, right. That's so that right off the bat too. I felt the the back of the heart, the diaphragm as that releases, the heart opens, right? So that's that's where it's going. And when I'm working with people, like I will feel their discomfort coming through the tone. I'll be like, okay, I feel that in my right hip. They're like, oh, my right hip hurts. I'm like, okay, it's hurting me too right now because I'm an empath. <laughs> <laughs> but that'll, you know, luckily that all passes. I mean, the, the part of this is my reaction of growing up as an empath, feeling other people's feeling, feeling other people's pain. But now when I have something I can do about it, like I'm not just the victim of your pain, I can pull out my fork, fix you, and then I'm not feeling your pain anymore. So this was a survival tactic on my part, you know, <laughs> to make my life more comfortable. Um, okay, so that that was that fork. Let's try um, 417 hertz. And we'll see where that wants to go. Where are you feeling that one, Anna? I feel it in my second chakra, sacral chakra, and I feel the energy moving upwards and outwards from my second chakra. Oh, and now it's, it is now moving through my whole body. Wow. Yeah, coming up in the head, right? Brightening up in the eyes. I can feel it moving as chills throughout my body, starting in my second second chakra. Wow. Right. And even though I've been exposed to the fork so much and you know, it's still making me yawn, I'm feeling energy move, right? So it's uh it's pretty wild. You know, and part of it is you're like you're sensitive and dialed in and you know, you're so tuned into this sort of thing. So you're a wonderful person to work with who really feels it. Oh, um, oh, this is amazing. Yeah. But even people who aren't sensitive, like when I work with them on a one-on-one, -on -one, by the end, they're like, my feet are tingling. I'm feeling energy moving here. It's, you know, it, it, it starts to act because there's no, because we're, you know, we might as well be right next to each other. Or we yeah. might as well just be one and the same, you know. It's, what did you feel? Not oh, just yeah. Then? Yeah, yeah. I definitely do. I mean, I'm a windsock of feeling. <laughs> this is a little complicated. Um, but yeah, I, when I'm working, like I feel things very exquisitely. In fact, it's the feelings in my own body that give me feedback about, you know, what other people are feeling. I'm just using my own body as like a a reflection or a mirror. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's in the throat now. And they're like, oh, yeah, it really is. <laughs> so I just feel it. Okay, so I got another one more fork we'll use. Um, and this is a brighter, prettier sound. This is a 528 hertz. So let's do a few with these, with this one, and see what we notice. All right, how about on that one, Anna? This one is very powerful. I felt like it expanded my whole biofield, my whole aura. It started in the at, in the top, the top of my heart center, like the very top. And in addition to like feeling a full expansion, 
it went to my eighth chakra above my head. But this is was really powerful and it's like encompassing my whole being. Yeah. That's what I felt. Yeah, me too. So I felt my central channel, like my, my, I really felt my electrical system. I felt energy flowing up and down. I was really aware of like my field around me, right? Same, same kind of thing. Um, that one, yeah, I really feel like helps really connect us to source. You know, I think a lot of the work that I do, the recordings that I have, the work that I do with people, people often say to me, your work reconnected me to source. I felt like I had lost connection and now I feel connected again. That's why I felt it went to my eighth chakra, you know, above above my head, above yeah. my crown chakra. Wow. Yeah. You know, and it's so important. Like to me, like I couldn't I couldn't imagine not feeling connected to source. Like I wake up every morning and I check in. Like the I, the, yeah. the source of my health, happiness, joy, gifts, everything is source, is light. My light loves to connect to the source of all light and rest in that companionship and love. And this work, how it's all about getting you more connected to your own light and your light plugged into source. Like that's health, that's healing, that's happiness, that's joy, that's grace. Like all the things we want are in that relationship. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. That was a beautiful experience. And for our listeners, I just would like to say I did not pretend. That was not scripted. I I can promise you that what I said, that's exactly what I felt. And yes, I do feel lighter. I do feel more relaxed. I mean, I'm still I'm still focused on on what I'm doing, but I most definitely felt the energy flow through my body as I always feel whenever there is energy flow, maybe because I'm really sensitive to it, but that wasn't scripted. I can assure you that I actually, I actually seriously felt it. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Aileen. Now, would you like to tell us more about your services, your workshops, your programs, and your two books. And obviously, I will include all the links to all your online presence, to, to the books and everything else in the show notes, so people will be able to, to contact you. But could you please talk to your work? What are your offerings in terms of both healing sessions and teaching, etc.? Uh, well, I only just recently restarted seeing clients again. I uh, I stopped in 2017 because I was too busy. I had created a line of tuning forks. I had a little store selling my books. Uh, I was teaching classes all over the country. Um, I was answering every email. <laughs> I was like doing, doing it all <laughs> myself. Um, and so I stopped seeing clients, but what I did start doing was making recorded sessions. And so I actually have created a very large library of recordings of biofield tuning sessions. So just like we just did that and you would listen the fork and you're feeling energy move these recordings. And there, there's all kinds of ones for different kinds of symptoms and organs and, you know, just relationships. Like there's a lot to choose from there and they're pretty modestly priced. There's also a handful of free ones, so you can check those out first. And those are all at the biofieldtuningstore.com. Um, so you can check out all those recordings. I have a whole bunch of video instruction, all kinds of different video instructions, uh, okay. the videos that are there. Uh, a five-week course called Tune Yourself into Health, where I teach you how to work on yourself, how to do biofield tuning on yourself. Uh, it explains the biofield anatomy. It explains all the forks and how you use them. So, you know, if you would just want to dive in and be your own therapist, you know, for wow. the cost of a few sessions, you can learn how to do it yourself. So, um, okay. Right. And that's not for you to do it on other people in charge. Like that's just self-education. So there's a number of different kinds of self-education videos. 
Um, but we also have a training program. We have a certificate program in biofiltering. It's all virtual. Uh, again, I didn't, just like I didn't think it was possible to do a session virtually, I didn't think it was possible to teach virtually either. <laughs> um, but my amazing team figured it out. And we have an exceptionally wonderful group of teachers and a very well put together online program that really supports people with one on one instruction. Like we have one, you have plenty of like one on one breakout time with an instructor. So we want to really make sure that you're learning it right. Um, and we, you know, we post classes regularly. They do fill up and sell out pretty quickly because there's a lot of people, you know, people experience this work and they just love it. And they're like, oh my God, it's like you said, it's so elegant. It's so simple. Like I want to learn how to do it. Um, and so we do have a big demand for our classes. Let's see what else we have. We have practitioners all over the world. So you can go and find a practitioner. Um, you can certainly get one remote and you can get them in person as well. If you find someone nearby. Do and you, do you do healing a uh, remote healing? Do well? I do? Yeah. Um, well, Oh, I guess I was going to say that I just started seeing clients again a few months okay, ago, Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. but I do, I do have a really limited number of slots, <laughs> but I, I am doing sessions again. So if somebody's mm -hmm. like, I really want to see Eileen, you can contact, uh, Dawn at biofieldtuning.com. She's my assistant. Mm -hmm. um, and then I've written two books, uh, Tuning the Human Biofield and Electric Body, Electric Health. And they're both on Audible. Um, okay. And yeah, so easy. And on Amazon. I, um, yeah, on, on Amazon. Amazon. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Tuning the Human Biofield has been out since 2014, but it is really, it's a bestseller. Like, it just keeps... It's, it's always just selling lots of copies, um, which I'm kind of amazed about. You know, when I wrote that book based on my master's thesis back in 2013, and I was like, who's going to want to write a silly little book about tuning forks? But we've sold tens and tens of thousands of copies of them. I don't know exactly how many, but a lot. And it's in its second printing. And, um, you know, it's, it's got a lot of surprising information in it because what I found doing this work was that in order to frame the context of the practice and how it worked, I had to tell a completely different cosmological story. I had to introduce my readers to two additional states of matter beyond what we learn about. We learn about solid, liquid, and gas, or at least that's all I did. But there's two more. There's plasma and ether, right? We learn about entropy and gravity, but there's also levity and syntropy. Like there's two more forces of nature that we don't learn about. And all of these things, the ether, the plasma, the syntropy, and the levity are all part of this practice. So so there's like a lot of, of bonus information you might not expect when you start to take a deep dive into mm. this work. So what would you say is, broadly speaking, the key difference between your two books, like in terms of the, the focus? Well, hmm. um, the first book is kind of like a broad overview. It's about sound. It's about um, cosmology. They, like I introduced the whole plasma cosmology. And I teach you in just one chapter all the steps you need to actually pick up like a 174 fork and comb it through somebody's field. So for the $15 book, if you read that chapter carefully, you can learn all the basics of biofield tuning. I laid it all out right there. People were like, well, there's not enough pages dedicated to the technique. I was like, the technique is really simple. <laughs> like, <there's, laughs> I don't need to like write a whole book about the technique. Does it have pictures? <laughs> it has some pictures. Um, <laughs> And then, people always ask, you know, for pictures. Yeah. Um, but if, if you combine the book with some of my instructional videos, like then you get the visuals as well, you know, so, mm. um, so. Okay. That's... And, and the second book, Electric Body. Yeah. So the second book, Electric Body doesn't tell you how to use tuning forks. It's more about how everything in life is electrical. Like when I was doing research for the book, I came across a whole bunch of mainstream articles in like nature or magazine, like all the, the mycelium network of, you know, mushrooms underground is all electric and the moon is magnetic. And just this sort of dawning awareness of how, wow, we are really electric beings in an electric environment. Um, and I go kind of like into a lot of detail about that, just to really kind of hammer home, like we are light. And it's scientific kind of thing. It's all waves in space. Uh, it's all vibration. 
Um, but then the second part is a very deep dive into the biofield anatomy and, and emotions. Because what I really found working with so many clients was that 95% of what derails us is undigested emotion. And so I go very specifically in each part of the biofield anatomy and the personality types and case studies of like right foot issues, right knee issues, right hip issues, like whatever part of the body you're going south in, this is where your mind is unbalanced. And so, you know, people see themselves obviously in these stories and in this, and it's really valuable information for people who who are body workers, who work, you know, who work with people to help them rehab, uh, to understand like, you know, why does your left shoulder keep bothering you even though the MRI or an x-ray show there's nothing wrong? Oh, because you're, you know, because your husband died two years ago and you've been accumulating heavy sadness ever since. Like this is the sort of thing that we would call psychosomatic pain. But it's not. It's like in the electrical system and it's related to states of mind mm -hmm. and tension as a consequence, yeah. right? So. Okay, beautiful. And I understand that people can also purchase from you tuning forks and there are some specific ones that you make or have made. So could you talk to that? Because that's really yeah. interesting. Yeah. So I've created my own line of tuning forks. Um, I, I use several, the 174, 417, and 528 are from a, a Solfeggio set that was created by somebody else. But I have them created in my own special metal alloy, actually. I ended up, because biofield tuning, we spend so much time in dissonance and distortion. What was happening was that ordinary tuning forks were breaking down. They were They were too rigid. And just like guitar strings wear out, when these forks were held in a lot of distortion, they started to lose their structural integrity. And so I worked with my manufacturer for two years almost to, uh, with a whole bunch of different alloys to create a, a special alloy that would hold up and stay bright and clear and strong um, in heavy distortion. So. Um, so my forks are, you know, they're, they're higher quality really than most of what you can buy out there because I'm a very picky professional with a lot of experience in the field and I know what I want to work with. Right. So, um, then I created a number of weighted forks. In fact, all the weighted forks that we sell are ones that I came up with the frequencies and then experimented with them. I love making prototypes and playing around with those. Um, I've made a lot of prototypes over the years, but again, I'm really... What, what is a weighted fork? What is it? Okay, so a weighted fork is, I don't know if you've ever gone to the doctor and they've pulled out a tuning fork that had barrels on the ends, activated it, and then placed like the handle on you. <laughs> Can you feel that? Can you feel that? Um, a weighted fork is, is a instrument that's designed for the vibration to come out the stem or the handle. So if a, if a doctor wants to see if you have neuropathy, for example, or like how far down or up your neuropathy goes, they'll activate a weighted tuning fork, put the handle on the body, and then you feel or don't feel that vibration. Um, so, okay. so that's, you don't hear a weighted tuning fork. Like they don't, they don't ring. They just kind of rumble. I'm mean, let me just activate one near my microphone. Ever so slightly. Yeah, exactly. So it's not, it isn't really a tiny hum, but no, not yeah, as a tiny hum. Exactly. That's what it is. Yeah. But if I placed it on you, you would feel a strong vibration. Whereas if I, when I activate an unweighted fork and I place the handle on you, you hardly feel the vibration at all because all of the action is going into the sound. Ah, that's the difference. Yeah, that's the difference. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So uh, in your remote sessions, do you use regular fork or weighted fork? Well, most of them I use the fork that you can hear. There are some, like there's one okay. called the spine where I actually use the weighted fork on the spine. Like I actually, ha I have a, um, not a crash test dummy, but a medical skeleton. <laughs> <laughs> 
crash dummy is good. <laughs> Maybe I need a crash test dummy. Um, I have a medical skeleton that I sometimes use. You might revive it. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, as a stand-in, if I'm working on specific bones or something, and so mm-hmm. I will put the weighted forks on the fake skeleton. <laughs> I'm like, okay, now I'm working okay. on this vertebrae. And it's weird. I mean, it's so weird. But people claim that they feel it and that they feel, yeah, yeah. that it makes a difference. You know, when I first started doing the groups, like I did a handful for free I, and I qu- queried everyone. I'm like, are you sure you feel it? Are you sure you're noticing something? Like, I don't want, what a weird thing to do. Like distance group tuning fork sessions. <laughs> like, for, I would never do such a thing personally. Exactly. <laughs> Other people did and told me that it worked. So I was like, well, it beats seeing 30 people a week, you know? So, well, if, if it works, it works. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. Well, Aileen, we could be talking for probably all whole day. There is so much to talk about and, and this is all such amazing, amazing information. And I am just in awe. It is it is mind blowing. But the time is catching up with us. So could you please give us a final message, what would you like to leave our audience with to perhaps either as a summary of this conversation or, or a key message that you would like to leave our audience with? Hmm. Well, what I've really observed and what I'm always in awe and amazement around is how extraordinary and amazing and wonderful humans really are. And how much we've been diminished through shame, through guilt, through judgment, through punishment, through bad education, through bad programming, uh, to make ourselves so much smaller and, you know, there's a whole lot of unworthiness going on out there. And what I've really discovered is that this feeling of unworthiness of not being good enough, you know, it's at the root of, of every issue I work on anybody with. It's like somehow they've decided that they're not good enough and they block God. They block life from, from coming in because most people have consciously or subconsciously swallowed the guilty sinner from birth story. You know, if you want to make somebody feel powerless, make them feel guilty. And that is what has been done to us as humans. We're we're actually very powerful, very beautiful, very amazing. Every single person is gifted. And when I have the privilege of seeing into someone's soul and saying to them, wow, you know, you are this and you are amazing. Look at, look at you. Everybody always says to me, I knew that. I knew that we, we know, we know our own greatness and our potential. Every single person has glimpsed into their own greatness, but you're too ashamed or too small or too unworthy or too guilty or too riddled with bad programming to actually step into it and own it. And, and I just want to invite you to believe in yourself and to believe in that vision. It's not too grandiose. It's not ego. It's truth. And, and working with sound is just, is one way. You know, there's other ways out there uh, to start to bring that part of you to the fore, to, to bring in your light and bring your light out into the world and shine and share the gifts that you have. Um, so, so yeah, believe in yourself and believe in those gifts and believe in your own ability to, to externalize them f- into your true potential. Wow. Thank you. What a beautiful beautiful message from I can tell from your higher self and just pearls of wisdom and inspiration well Aileen thank you so very much for your time for your beautiful presence and for sharing with us your amazing amazing work and knowledge and insight it's been such a pleasure and I uh, I will include all the links in the show notes and I encourage everyone interested in this topic or even, even out of curiosity to find out more about it, to visit your website and, and peruse it and get all the information. And if you can, 
to try it and see the results. Thank you so much, Aileen. Thank you, Anna. It was my pleasure as well. Thank you. That's all for today, folks. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you really loved it, please post a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify to encourage others to listen to it. For the show notes and other podcast info, please go to my website at quantumliving.com.au forward slash podcast. And if you'd like to dive deeper into quantum living and explore how you could work with me, please contact me and I'd be delighted to help and support you on your quantum journey. I am your host, Anna Anderson. I look forward to connecting with you in the next episode of Quantum Living. Until then, keep your vibrations high and be well.